Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Now, just by way of introduction, a uh, little story here that uh, some of y'all might know a little bit about this. Anybody own a Winchester? Okay, a couple are right, good, good, good. All right, so I got a little story for you uh, related to that. The Winchester Mansion in San Jose, California, this popular tourist spot, it attracts thousands annually. Sarah Winchester, the widow of the gun company owner, built this massive structure over 38 years from 1884 until she died in 1922. She employed teams of carpenters, masons, and other workers who worked around the clock to keep the house under constant construction. There's been various stories about the reason behind this unusual practice of hers. Some say that Mrs. Winchester believed she was haunted or would be haunted by the ghost of those who were killed by her husband's weapons unless she kept building her home. Others believe that she thought she would not die as long as she kept building and continued building for all those years that she spent building this house. Regardless, she continued ordering more renovations and construction as long as she lived. The Winchester Mansion has over 10,000 windows, doorways, and stairs that many lead just directly to blank walls. And it has around 160 rooms. It is estimated that she spent over $70 million in today's money on a largely pointless construction, all in a desperate search for peace that was ultimately doomed to fail. Along with that, many today seem to be seeking peace through equally fruitless means. They turn to pleasure, they turn to drugs, they turn to alcohol, immorality, wealth, and uh, many other dead-end avenues. They pursue such paths that never bring true peace, and they are like the staircases that lead nowhere in this Winchester mansion. Instead, we find peace when we follow the path that God has given us in His Word. And this morning, I want to show you some very, very straightforward passages that can help us all to understand how we can enjoy peace in a very panicked world that we're living in today. And I hope this morning's message will be helpful to you. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So peace, what is peace? If you were to go and grab a Webster's Dictionary, you'd find peace is defined as freedom from distraction. Um, it also has this idea of a state of rest or being free from disturbance. Verse 6 in our passage, if you look back at that with me in chapter 4 there, it says to not be careful, to not be careful. This word is actually the opposite of peace. And I know most of us, we're looking for peace. I believe we are. You might say, well, I don't know if I am. I, I, I bet you are. I, I guarantee deep down you are. Everybody's looking for peace. And in the passage, it says this word again, careful, which is the opposite of that. It's the opposite of peace. It has this idea of one being divided, one who's anxious, one who is worried. And worry is a very familiar feeling experienced by the vast majority of people in the world today. It can arise from various sources, ranging from concerns about one's future, uh, such as maybe a career path, uh, your finances, your family, a spouse, if you're about to uh, get into a, a deep relationship, or maybe you've been into a relationship for a while and it's on the rocks, and so you're concerned or worried about your spouse. Uh, worries about one's eternal future so often come flooding into our minds at times, such as death, heaven, hell, and other possibilities that may be out there. In reality, people can worry about anything and everything. It is something that happens daily in our lives. The Bible has the answer to our worries, and it's called God's peace. But where does God's peace come from? How exactly do, do I receive it, and how do I keep God's peace? Well, first off, let's address the areas 
of our being that worry. There's three, the mind, the body, and the spirit. And I'm going to address these this morning. Worry starts in the mind. It affects the body. But ultimately, it comes from the spirit, believe it or not. So how do you enjoy God's peace in all three of these areas at the same time? Well, you have to start with the spirit. You know, in the world, I mean, there's so many, especially in the United States, there's so many luxuries available, and they are easily available today as compared to the way they used to be. I'm a child from, well, I was born in the 80s, so I grew up during that time and even into the 90s, and, and I didn't have it nearly as bad as some of the others who were older, are older than me, but I know that in the 80s and 90s, there were limitations. There were things that we didn't have access to that I have at my fingertips today. And I believe that many people are trying to curve or combat their worries through material things in this world, trying to settle the worry of the mind, trying to settle the worry of the heart, not realizing that the first place that needs to be addressed is the spirit. The spirit is the center of man. It is the center of your being, your existence. And it's at that place that worry is really birthed. And then from there, that will affect all the other areas of your being, the mind and the body. So we're going to start with the spirit this morning. And I find that in verse 4, we have the answer to peace for my spirit. Look at verse 4 with me. Paul, the writer here, says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. He says, Rejoice in the Lord. How can a person rejoice in the Lord? First off, you must be a born-again child of God. If you've never been born again, then there's no way for you to rejoice in the Lord. The only one who can rejoice is one who has been born again and added to the family of God. God has declared in His Word in many passages that all of the human race is sinful and has come short of God's glory. All of the human race is condemned to die and to go to an eternal hell. And this is a very worrisome thing in our spirit. This is absolutely horrifying. No relief. Eternity is not temporal. Eternity does not have an expiration date. Eternity is eternity. And for a heart, for a spirit to think that I am condemned by God, it's not about my good works because they're filthy rags in the eyes of a holy and righteous God. Therefore, I am condemned by God. That is a horrifying feeling down in the deep spirit of mankind, whether it be men or women, that one would spend time in this place, no relief, no mercy, no grace, no forgiveness, burning in hell forever and ever. The, the, the Word of God mentions it like this. It says, a place where the worm dieth not. And many people have tried to figure out that interpretation. Personally, I feel like it's referring to the most subtle, subtle bits of satisfaction in life. I'm telling on myself right now, but right now I have a twitch in my right eye. It just happened. and I'm, I'm going to reach up here and I'm going to touch that. And I'm going to stop it by doing that. You know, it's one of those nerves that roll over and it starts to affect just the way your body functions. When a person goes to hell, they'll have no strength in them whatsoever to even reach up and to scratch an eye that has a slight itch. That's the worm that dieth not. The smallest, simplest of satisfactions that we take for granted now that are only by the mercy and grace of our Creator, those will not be quenched. In hell. And when a person understands that feeling, they will understand that that is a horrifying feeling that brings about an unrest and a disturbance in the spirit of man that must be calmed in some form or another. And the only way it can be calmed is through God Almighty. Now, in the book of Romans, if you will, turn, turn with me over to chapter 1. Now, you might say, yeah, but uh, you might be saying, yeah, but I don't understand. How would a person know these things? How would they understand that their spirit is feeling such a way? Maybe it's just my mind. If I go to a therapist, they can settle my worry. 
maybe it is just my body because my health is down. And when your health is down, it kicks you know, off uh, different things, dopamines and endorphins. I know we got all these chemicals in our bodies that do different things. And so it, it messes all that up. Well, maybe it's that, not according to the Word of God. In Romans chapter 1, Paul was given the liberty by the Holy Spirit's leading to write down a truth that had really been concealed other than just in a few other passages until right here. And it's something that God teaches us about us as His creation. Now, before I go into the passage, I love art, and I've, I've been into art for a long time, and I've kind of gotten out of it because I went to the pastorate. But when I was younger, I used to draw and paint, and I'd do all sorts of things that um, just were creative. And I got into comic book illustration for a while. And I had a way where I loved, I loved a lot of texture on the comic pages that I would draw. And the way I would get that texture is I'd use a toothbrush I'd use the bristles of maybe a paintbrush, and then I would use my fingerprints. Most people didn't know this. And they'd look at the textures on some of my illustration work, and they'd say, man, that's so neat. How in the world do you get that particular texture? Well, nobody knew except me. I'm the creator of the painting or the picture, right? And I knew, because I remember the time when I sat and created that, that I would sit there with my toothbrush, and I would spatter some texture on there, and then I would take my finger... And I would roll it in ink or paint, and I would gradually tap it. My thumb mostly is what I'd use. Sometimes I'd use my index finger. And I'd gradually tap on that picture. And I would create the texture using my fingerprints. Nobody knew that except me unless I told them. And the reason why I knew it is because I'm the creator. God knows what we're made of and what we are on the inside because we have the touch of God on us, meaning that we were made in the image of God and we were made by His hands. Now, as we read in Romans chapter 1, if you will, look at, at verse 18 with me. I want to show you something. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. God has revealed something to each and every human being, every man, woman, and child who's ever been created, God has revealed something to them deep down in their spirit. Now keep reading with me. Verse 20. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. That's us. Even His eternal power and Godhead, His authority, His power, all those things so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like two corruptible man into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. You know what these passages teach us? God's creation knows that they are condemned to hell. God's creation knows that they have come short of the glory of God. God's creation, all of God's creation, deep down inside, knows that there is some unrest down in their spirit. We often refer to it as a God-shaped void that we are trying to fill with other things in this world only to mask the true root of the problem. And the root of the problem is that my spirit is, unre is in unrest because I don't know God is my God and the Lord is my Savior. Fear comes from the spirit of man. So if I want peace, I need the living God inside of my heart. I need the living God inside of my spirit. A person must recognize that they are a sinner on their way to hell. They cannot save themselves and therefore there is no hope for them. They are in a terrible, terrible situation. It is not about good deeds. It is not about a church denomination. It is not about a, a style of dress. None of these things matter when it comes to salvation. They are all absolutely irrelevant. Because we have already come short 
of God's holiness. We have already failed to hit the mark of who God is. And therefore, none of those things that we often do in order to sort of mask the problem, none of them can ever help us. Because we are sinners in the eyes of God, condemned to an eternal hell. And as the Scriptures say, he that hath the Son, well, he's not condemned, but he that hath not the Son is condemned already because we have not the Son. Receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. That's the answer to the troubled spirit. Back in Philippians chapter 4 again, he says, Rejoice in the Lord. And again I say rejoice. What am I rejoicing in? I'm rejoicing in the fact that I have been born again by the grace of God. What is grace? Grace is unmerited favor. Grace has no dealings about me. It doesn't have anything to do with me. I did nothing to receive the grace of God. I did nothing to be saved. I did nothing to be right with God. Though I am a pastor and I've been in ministry for many years, and I have tried my best to walk hand in hand with God and walk according to what God has taught us in the Word, all of that is irrelevant because none of it brought me into a relationship with God. I am what I am simply because of God's unconditional grace, His love. And the peace that I have in my spirit has been placed there by a God who has bestowed upon me His infinite grace. And even, in my, even, even during my hardest times and at my worst moments in life, I still enjoy the grace of God when He reminds me, Tim, you shouldn't have done that. Tim, you shouldn't have said that. Tim, you need to confess. Tim, you need to make that right. Tim, you need to get right. You're my child. You ought not walk in that way. You ought not go down that path. You need to straighten out. Bring those sins before me and I'll forgive you and you'll have peace again. All that is simply because of the grace of God. Rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. That begins with salvation. Peace in the Spirit is where my peace begins. Peace down inside of me is where that begins. For a person who is lost, they must first recognize they are a sinner before God. They are on their way to hell. They cannot save themselves. There is no hope for them. They are in a terrible situation. and They need a rescuer. They need a Savior. After that, they must understand that Jesus Christ did not come just to be a figure in history, just so that we might have big, beautiful buildings and churches and Money flows through Christianity and all this garbage that has taken place today. But Jesus Christ literally came to save sinners. And that is the only reason that He came when He came 2,000 years ago. To save the sinner. 1 Timothy chapter 1 would tell you that. As Paul the Apostle, who once wreaked havoc on the Christian church, arrested many born-again believers, threw them in jail and had them sentenced to death, one day had an encounter with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus and was gloriously saved. And then in 1 Timothy, he writes, Jesus came to save sinners of whom I am chief. He knew what he was. He knew that he deserved hell more than all of us sitting in this room. And yet by God's grace, God came to such a man to deliver him and to save his unworthy soul. And that put peace inside of Paul. That put peace down in his spirit. So a person who is looking for peace in their spirit, they must first realize that they have sinned and come short of God's glory. And because of their shortcomings, they are sentenced to hell. There's no questions about it. You can't argue it. If you argue it, you're arguing against the Almighty Creator. You can't sit and say, but there's other ways to heaven. I can go through this, or I can go through that, or I can do this, or I can do that, or I can say this, or I can say that. That's all baloney. That's all lies. I must accept what God has said. All have sinned and come short of my glory. There is none righteous, no, not one. And then when I realized that, I realized that hell was not made for man. It was made for the devil and his angels. But hell is the destination of the sinner. And they are condemned. I'm in a horrible situation. I might have 20 years ahead of me. I may have 40 years ahead of me. I may have 50 or 60 years ahead of me. 
ahead of me. But one day, as the Bible says, it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. That's when I'll stand before my Creator, and there'll be no hope for me if I enter into death without a Savior. That's a terrible place to be. That brings an, un- that brings an unrest into the soul of an individual that Romans 1 identifies and says, that's where your trouble is spawning from. That's where your unrest is at. It's down in your spirit. It's because you don't know your Creator. You don't know the one true God. You've turned Him into something corruptible, but yet He's the incorruptible one. And when a person realizes they're there, now the next step, they must realize over here what God has done for them. That 2,000 years ago, God took on the form of a man, Jesus of Nazareth. That he lived a life without sin, perfect in every way, no spots, no blemishes. That he went to a Roman cross, and when he died there, he was being rejected by a sinful world, but yet he was putting himself on that cross to be the Savior of those sinners. And as he hung on that cross, the Son of God took our place became our substitute, became our Savior. His blood was shed. His blood was shed for the remission of my sin and your sin. And as He hung there on the cross, He's taking the punishment of all sin, past, present, and future. And in His last words, He looked at the Father in heaven. He said, Father, it is finished. Unto Thee I commend my spirit. And He died. He was buried. And then three days later, the father showed that he accepted the son's death because he rose from the grave. He was delivered for our offenses. He was raised again for our justification. It's in Christ that we are made whole. It's in Christ that we have peace. It's in Christ that we are saved, redeemed, bought back from a from a lost and sinful and dying world condemned to hell and added into the family of God as God's special children. And it's in Christ that we receive the presence of the Holy Ghost who puts peace down in our spirit. That means a person who stands over here and realizes, yes, I am a sinner in the eyes of God. What will I do? I have no hope in myself. I can't redeem myself. I can't save myself. What can I possibly do? You must turn from that and turn to the one who hung on the cross for you. And you must turn from the sinful life and turn to the one who hung there on the cross and you must by faith, by faith believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again from the grave on the third day according to the scriptures. And by faith... In the one who hung on the cross, you call on his name and you say, I'm unworthy of such things, but please, God, save me. And Jesus will not turn you away. And you know what will happen? God's grace will be bestowed upon you. God's grace. Not God's favor. Not God's respect. Not God's compassion. Not God's not even fully God's love because God already loved us when He put His Son on the cross. John 3.16 would tell you that. It's God's grace. And grace is unmerited favor. That means you receive something from the Almighty Creator that you do not deserve. And when you understand that, You will be able to do as Paul says right here in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. My God is a God of grace. And His grace is sufficient in my time of need. And I have had many needs in my life where I have needed the grace of God and it has been sufficient. And no matter the storms of life and the trials that I face, no matter what things I don't understand and what times I need wisdom, I can rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice because I am a born-again believer who has been saved by the grace of God and God alone. And my spirit is at rest in my Creator and my Savior. That's the beginning of peace. 
And maybe this morning, that's exactly what you need is you need to start there. Well, this is the first step. You need assurance in salvation. You need assurance. You know, that's where peace comes from. It's assurance. I've met people that have been saved, but they have no peace. They have no peace because they're living contrary to what God has commanded them to do in their Christian life. They've got things in their day-to-day life that they're not doing properly. They're not attending a church on a regular basis. They're not growing in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're not being faithful to read their Bibles and to pray and to do the simpler things of Christianity. They're not telling anybody about Jesus. They are contrary to the Word, and therefore they have an, an uneasy feeling down in their soul, and they seem to have no rest. Assurance of salvation settles much of that. I believe the devil wants us to believe we're not saved. The devil wants you to believe it's some great work for you to get right with God. The devil wants you to doubt your salvation. The devil wants you to continuously think that you, 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 don't, you didn't get it. You didn't get it right. You need to get it again. And there's people, they get it again and again and again and again and again, and that's all they do their whole life is constantly go back to the same beginning place where they confess their sins all over again. They call on Jesus never to get right. Hey, just by faith. There's no, there's no perfect recipe to it all. Right now, by faith in your heart, turn from sin and turn to the living God. Recognize Jesus as Savior. Call on His name in your heart and you'll be gloriously saved. That's the grace of God. And that's what settles the Spirit. There's nothing else in this world that'll do it. Alcohol won't do it. Drugs won't do it. Women won't do it. Men won't do it for some, I guess. Cars won't do it. Property won't do it. Money's not going to do it for you. If that's what you're chasing after, you're a fool. You're a fool because it all burns up. There's no U-Haul that follows the hearse on the way to the graveyard. You lose it all when you leave. We come into the world naked, we leave the world naked. All you have is what you secure in God Almighty through His Son, Jesus Christ. That's all you'll have when you leave this life. So there's peace for my spirit that I enjoy when I can rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And you rejoice by placing your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That's the beginning of your peace. So if you're looking for peace this morning, hey, that's where you need to start. As we move into the next part here in the passage, that uh, back in Philippians chapter 4, we move to verse 5. We find now as we move into the next part of peace, we go from the spirit to the mind. Peace for my mind. How do I get peace for my mind? It says here in the passage, verse 5, Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. First off, he says, Let your moderation be known. The Lord is at hand. How do I receive peace for my mind in this way? Well, well, moderation has this idea of of a, of a person who has become gentle in their nature. They've become one who is now restrained, one who is self-controlled. Here's what this tells us, that there is a seeable change in the life of the born-again believer. Now, here's what I'm trying to do for you this morning. I'm trying to help you to examine your, your situation with God. I'm trying to help you to examine your relationship with Him. I've started with the spirit, but now I'm moving to the mind. Often people have their minds rattling around. Am I, am I, am I? What am I? Am I there? Am I not there? What is it true? Is it not true? Why is the mind so unstable? In the passage here, it says, let your moderation be known unto all men. I believe what we find here is that we ought to ask ourselves this question. Is there seeable evidence in your life that you have been changed by God? Is it evident that you are now different since you have been saved? Someone says, well, I was saved at five. Okay, well, I guess there's not much difference that can happen there. Your litmus test would be, how different from the world are you? He that that loveth the world hath no love for the Father in him. That's what it says in 1 John. So how different from the world am I? There's your litmus test. But this idea of moderation is referring to someone who has been changed. Someone who is drastically different and all the people around them can see that person is not the same. They're not the same. 
See, the devil's going to utilize your mind as a battlefield. That'll happen on a daily basis. Mark it down, he's attacking. And he loves attacking God's children because he wants to cripple you in your Christian walk so that you'll never grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord and you'll never amount to anything for God. The devil sees that as a victory. Though he may not get you in hell, there's a whole lot of people in your life that he will take to hell with him. That's a victory. So in Paul's writing here, I believe what we can say is if I'm getting to the peace that passeth all understanding, before I get there, I've got to get some assurance about my salvation. And for it to be settled in my mind, my mind ought to examine my life and say, do people see a change in me? Am I different now? How much like the world am I? And I'm not, I, and I know people come up with all sorts of things. You know, people got all this mess about, I, I, I heard a lady the other day talking about uh, dress codes for Christians and how it's just a subjective thing and it's relative. You do what you want to do. And uh, I believe she was about half naked when she was doing the uh, uh, little video she was doing anyway. So th those things don't fall into that category. Right now, here's a simple litmus test, and I'm going to give you a Bible passage for it. Are you different since you, now that you've come in contact with Jesus? Are you different now than you were before? Simple test. You say, why does that matter? Because the God of creation is inside of you. That matters. Because the Holy One dwells in you. That matters. We're not talking about some shallow, superficial Christianity that many people seem to enjoy on a regular basis. I am talking about real Christianity, real life-changing encounters with God where you go from, th from this completely different figure in life to someone drastically different. Your desires are different. Your passions are different. Your pursuits are different. Your love is different. Your patience is different. Your moderation is known by all people. You find me one person in the Bible who was truly saved that did not experience this change. And I'll take this point out of the message. You will not find it. Every single person came from something. Think of Abraham for a minute. Many years prior to the Lord Jesus Christ, he's dwelling in the land of Mesopotamia, in the Ur of the Chaldees. You know who he's worshiping? False pagan idols. But one day the God in heaven called on Abraham and said, Abraham, come out from your land. Leave behind your family. Go to a land that I will show you. And you know what Abraham did? He once went this way, and he turned, and he went this way. Yes, Lord, I'm going. All the different... Jacob. Jacob born, holding on to the heel of his brother Esau, given the name Jacob, the supplanter, the one who's going to do what he can to crawl his way up to the top. Deceives his father, deceives his brother, deceives his uncle. But then he finally comes in contact with God, and he was never changed after that. And even God had to change his name to Israel. God prevails is what Israel means. You move into the New Testament. Peter, the one who once pursued his passion of fishing, had his own fishing business, went out on the seas of Galilee, searching for the fish day after day after day. He hears the call from the shore, follow me. He leaves it all behind, and he follows the Lord. Paul later on, as I've already mentioned, once was destroying the church of God, and then on the road to Damascus, he's saved, and now he's building the church of God. You can't get away from the fact that God changes people. And my friend, it doesn't matter what type of simple prayer you said, if you were never changed, then you've never experienced the encounter of God in your life, and God is not in you, but He wants to be in you, if you'll simply by faith call on Him. And then peace is coming along with that. Your mind will be settled, because your spirit is settled. Let your moderation be made known unto all men. And what does it say? The Lord. The Lord is at hand. You know what that means? The Lord is present. The Lord is present. In addition to that, there is a prophetic sense of the coming of the Lord that one could pull from the passage. But in the text, he's referring to the fact that the Lord is present in that individual. In my mind, though the devil might war against me and say, Tim, are you truly saved? 
Are you sure Jesus is there? Are you sure you didn't just go through some rituals and you just think you're saved? What I can tell the devil is I can say, devil, no, my life is different because of Jesus. My life has been changed because of Jesus. I am not the same because I have been born again by the precious blood of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit and through the grace of God my Father. And I am a new creature in Christ. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And I can go to the devil and I can find peace in that because I can say, no, I can look at my life and everybody knows I'm different than I used to be. And I've got no reason to sit here and give you my rap sheet, but I was a horrible child. And I was a horrible teenager. I've been in trouble with law. I've been expelled from school not to be let back when I was in my high school years. I've had my fair share of trouble in my life, but I am a new creature in Christ. And it's only because of Christ. And therefore, when the devil comes in the back of my mind and he says, Tim, are you so sure about this? Do you stand in that pulpit and you preach all these messages? But when the rapture happens, you're not going. You're staying here. And I can say to the devil, I know I'm going because I'm different. And there's something inside of me that's not from me. Because I know who I was. And I know what I was capable, capable of in my own flesh. And the one who entered into me changed me and made me new and made me different. And I laid aside all my passions of illustration and all these things I had pursuit of. I laid it aside just for the sake of the gospel so that I might follow Christ. Jesus changed me. He changed me. And He'll change you as well. Let your moderation be made known unto all men. The Lord is at Hand. Go to 2 Corinthians with me. That's to the left there from Philippians. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, if you will. Look with me at verse 5. It is not blasphemous and it is not wrong to question your salvation. The Bible tells us to do such things. Look at 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Paul says, examine yourselves. Whether ye be in the faith, you know what he's saying? He's saying, question your salvation. Are you really saved? Did you truly turn from that sin and repent and put your faith in Jesus Christ? Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. He says, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be a reprobate? A reprobate is someone who has calloused their heart to the point of not really knowing one way or the other. And the rituals that they perform in their Christianity is something they just go through just by habit. But there's no life in it. It's a dead religion. And if not for the sake of some beautiful musical presentation, there's no stir in their soul. There's no stir. Christianity is alive. It's living. Our God is a living God. My relationship with Him should be a living relationship. Day after day, moment after moment, He's alive in me and things are happening. I'm not always everything I should be. There are days where I'm worse than I was the day before and there's days where I'm better than I was the day before. But in all those times, my God is alive and He constantly is bearing witness with my spirit that I'm a child of God and my Father wants me to be like Him, holy, living righteously, separated from a sinful world, being a light in a world that is very dark, being salt in a world that is very unsavory. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Know whether or not you have been born again. Let your moderation be made known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Others should be able to see Christ in me, and others should be able to see Christ in you. You shouldn't have to always bear witness just with your mouth. It should be in your life. Your testimony through your actions is often more impactful than what you say. You know, I can go and I can go down the street here, and I've actually knocked on just about every door here around the church in the years I've been here. And I, 
honestly, right now, I can't think of, well, actually, there's two people, now that I think about it, there's two people that were not believers. All the others claim that they were born-again believers. All of them. That's a lot of people. As far as I know, only a few of them actually attend any local assembly anywhere. Only a few of them even know maybe 1% of what the Scriptures say. Only a few of them are actually praying outside of their meals on a daily basis. Only a few of them are probably even reading their Bibles and bearing witness of God. This is a dangerous type of Christianity. Because we are to be a light and salt in a very, very dark and unsavory world. And the reason why many of these people, as I know, often find themselves going to the therapist for help with their marriage and their relationships. They find themselves going to the doctor to get pills to help with mental issues and instability and depression problems. They find themselves going maybe to a bottle or maybe to something else along the way. Why do they do that? If they're a child of God, why would you need all those things? You wouldn't. If my Almighty God is in me, isn't He able? Scripture says He can do the impossible. Can't He relieve me of depression? Can't He relieve me of anxiety? Can't He relieve me of of worries and fears? Can't He deliver me from such things? Isn't He powerful enough to do such things? If He spoke the world into existence, if He redeemed my unworthy soul from, from condemnation to hell... Can't my God deliver me from the stress and the worry of the world? I believe he can. So maybe the other issue is whether or not that true that person is truly saved. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Paul says, Let your moderation be made known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Because he's at hand, you can rejoice always. And again, I say rejoice. Rejoicing in the grace of God, the presence of God, the power of God. The Bible goes on to say, as we move into the next verse, verse 6, it says, be careful for nothing. The battle of the mind stems from the mind's endless imagination of what-if scenarios. That's really all this... Troubles that we deal with, all the worries that we have, they're all what-if scenarios. You know why? Because they haven't come yet. They haven't happened yet. It's, yeah, but tomorrow this is going to happen. You don't know that. You might die tonight. Yeah, but next week this is going to happen. You don't know. How do you, Jesus could return and it's all over. It's always the what-if. It's the what-if, the what-if, the what-if. And the what-if scenario is that battlefield where the devil sits and stands fully armored, attacking constantly the mind of anyone, whether a child of God or not. It's the what-if scenario. So what does God say in His Word for us to get the peace that passeth all understanding? He says, be careful for nothing. Now, the word careful, not really a word that we use in the same way today. It simply means to be anxious, to be worried. It means to be divided. And Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. I've had my moments of worry. Where I was, it was almost like my mind was divided. This is what I know I should do, but this is what I'm worried about happening, and this is what I'm this, and this is what I'm that. It's all that word means. He says, be worried, be anxious about nothing. Don't live in these what if scenarios. The mind must be stayed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Why are you troubled? Why, why would we be troubled? What is the thing that's troubling me? Well, we ought to bring it all to the cross, bring it all to the Lord. Romans chapter 8, and I'm going to turn there fast, but if you can turn there as quickly, then follow along with me. If not, just listen. Romans <coughs> chapter 8, verse 35 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Are you a child of God? This is for you. Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Verse 36 reminds us that the world will persecute the children of God, but it's all part of God's plan so that God might be glorified in the end because all things work together for good for those that love Him according to His purpose. Nay, in all these things, verse 7, 
and all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You say, but I have a, my, my mind races with what-if scenarios. Recognize that you are safe and secure in the love of Christ Jesus our Lord. In the mind, it's a matter of understanding we have to lay aside the worries, let go of the worries, and start trusting in the shepherd. Remember Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Is he my shepherd? Remember, we've settled that. Now I have no want, no fear, no worry, no anxiousness, no carefulness. God has control for the child of God who is faithful to follow the leadership of God. Back in Philippians 4 again, it says, be careful for nothing. But instead, why don't you do this? Here's a new plan. Here's a new tactic. In everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Here you've got in everything, here's the remedy for your worry. First off, your prayer. That's a general term. It just means all your prayers. Form a habit of praying without ceasing. Pray about what you're going to do today. Pray about what you're going to eat this morning. Pray about what you'll wear. Pray about uh, where you're going. Ask God to give you a safe trip. Ask God to uh, give you a good day at work. Just pray, pray, pray. That's a general term. In addition to that, couple along with that, supplication. That's a more specific prayer. That's a prayer of action. That's a prayer that goes and said, God, I need this. Lord, I need you to do this. It's a begging of God to do something. And then the third thing is, when you do pray, pray with thanksgiving. That you're content with whatever the outcome is. God, not my will, but thine be done. Lord, I'm thankful in anything that you decide to do. I'm thankful. It's often where people mess up with their prayers. They're only thankful when God does exactly what they want. God has a perfect will. And if he saved me unconditionally by his grace, I believe he'll keep me also unconditionally by his grace. If he decides that I need to go through some type of trial, I'm sure it's for my perfection. You know why? Because now I'm walking by faith and not by sight. Because I've repented and received the Son of God as my Savior. Thanksgiving. See, often a selfish will hinders our prayers. When my will is selfish and I'm, I'm saying, God, you didn't answer my prayer and therefore I'm not going to church anymore. Well, just mark it down. You're not going to have a prayer life after that. God's favor is no longer going to be on you. You may not lose your salvation if you are saved, but I, I guarantee you, you will be miserable for the rest of your days until you get back in a relationship with the Lord. The struggle ends when the gratitude begins. Every day our blessings are greater than our problems. You ought to remember that. In your darkest moments, just remember your blessings are far greater than your problems. So pray in everything. That's how you get peace in the mind. And then we move to the third one as I conclude the message. That leads to peace for the body. Look at verse 7. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. There's the body. Did you know that every 30 seconds, 33 seconds, someone dies from some type of heart disease in the world? And they say that stress is one of the main culprits for creating high blood pressure, which then does great damage on the cardiovascular system, the heart. And if we could find peace in God again, starting with the spirit, moving to the mind, it eventually affects the body. And the heart slows down, the blood pressure goes down, things start to settle, and suddenly the peace that passeth all understanding is truly, literally, keeping our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus, who is our Lord. Isn't that wonderful? The body, peace for the body. Your physical health is at risk, uh, is at risk because we do not have the peace of God in our lives. 
Peace comes from the Prince of Peace. Peace comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. And chasing worldly pleasures and pursuits will never bring true peace to a person. Only by following God's path as given in His Word can we actually find lasting peace from a deep relationship with our wonderful, loving, almighty Creator. And this morning, I hope you'll find peace in Christ. You know, the Bible says that no one comes to the Son unless the Father draws Him. And this morning, maybe at some point in the message, whether it was the mention about the Spirit, maybe the mind, maybe the body, but at some point, maybe there was a drawing going on. I hope as we conclude the service, and these men come up to uh, play the um, altar call music here, that wherever you are, I pray you'll allow the Lord to help you this morning. That you might have peace. Hey, for somebody who's lost, if there's a struggle and it's been there because there's no rest, then this morning, by faith, that's all it is, by faith, be willing to believe what God has said, that all have sinned and come short of His glory, and call on Jesus Christ to save you. And God will not turn you away. Any that come to Him, He'll not turn away. He'll save. Whosoever, that's everybody, calleth on the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Just believe. Just believe. For maybe someone who's come this morning, you've been out of the will of God for a while, and you've been struggling concerning your walk with Him. You're missing out on peace simply because you're not walking with your heavenly Father. You're not walking with the one who brought you into His family. The Bible says if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And this morning, that's all it takes. By faith, come.